everyone. Welcome to another BDC talk uh, during Flex Week. I need to shut off the transcription. Right, I'm here with somebody that I've been so excited to get him to join us this morning. The one and only Kiming Yap. So Kiming, welcome to Design School. Man, I'm very excited to have you on and for many, many reasons because when you're an award-winning design entrepreneur, you're passionate about how design can transform lives for the better. You're also a leading expert with branding and design strategies with probably over 15 years of experience or even more. You've collaborated with partners across a broad range of industries, including technology, retail, healthcare, beauty, food and beverage, furniture, industrial and government. You're a co-founder and managing director of Creatius. And that's an interdis interdisciplinary brand and design management consultancy uh, based in Singapore and with offices in Jakarta and Milan. You're also a recipient of multiple awards. Your works have been widely published and ex exhibited at international platforms such as London Design Festival, Triennial Design Museum, Salon de Mobile. And not just that, you're also the author of the book, Are You Brand Dead? You serve on the prestigious Singapore Brand Award judging panel. You're also a council member at Singapore Manufacturing Federation and Design Business Chamber, Singapore, and you were conferred the title of Distinguished Professor of the Shanghai Academy of Fine Arts. You hold a Master of Design from Domus Academy Milan. And finally, something that we both have in common, a passion towards how design can improve the lives of people drive social change, create a more sustainable future. So without further delay, let me pass the mic to Kim Ming. We're so glad to have you with us today this morning. Thank you. Thank you, CY. Thank you for that uh, very long introduction. Uh, yeah. You said the entire uh, self-introductory uh, slides. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, OK, let me just uh, share my slides now. And, and uh, well, I'm really, really excited to see so many of you here. I, I'm a bit surprised and uh, really, really appreciative that uh, you're taking time off to listen to me, share a little bit about my background um, and also, my, well, I guess, my love for design. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me just... Let me just jump right into it. OK, so uh, the topic that I want to talk about today is really about the transformative power design. Um, that sounds like a, wow, a very big word, right? Wow, design, power, transformation. What, what exactly is that? Um, and I think that the best way to share is really through my own experience right? as a designer, as an entrepreneur. Uh, then also some of my own observations, like you know, working with clients, um, and hopefully it can inspire you guys. Right? I, I I suppose that most of you here are design students, right? In TP, um, and that through my sharing again, like what CY said later on, if any questions, any questions, just feel free to let me know. I'm really happy to share and discuss with you. You know, have a little bit of like a. Uh, even starring right on really you know what, what can really design do you know especially in today's time so i guess i don't have to <laughs> go too much into this slide see why they said it all but yeah so this is uh, me now um so yeah i i run a design and branding company consultancy called creative Events, and some of the other roles that i have um but i guess that today's talk is really not so much about what I am doing now, but I think more of why, why, right? Why am I having these roles and why um, being having the opportunity to sit on some of these councils, uh, you know, being involved in some of these uh, academies and all that are important to me as a designer. Um, and I'll share with you why later, or maybe hopefully you could see how they all actually come together, uh, you know, to, in terms of how actually design is at the heart of all of this. Um, and again, 
uh, see you have shared that. <laughs> so uh, is that, you know, yeah, I, I do work uh, with clients across the board, you know, with uh, clients big and small MNCs, SMEs from various industries and also across different design disciplines, right? So from product design, service design, UI, UX, graphic, packaging, design thinking, branding, and so on. Um, and I think just before I go into, you know, a bit of my own story is that design to, in today's world is really interdisciplinary, right? Uh, yes, as students here, I'm also a okay, uh, designer, right? You know, we all come with our own vertical, our own design background, um, but you, you will see that, you know, design is, a, is converging, right? It converges different, um, you know, it, it helps industries, right? It helps your clients converge different ideas into a solution. And in today's world, solutions are never single discipline, uh, single discipline, right? Um, and uh, you will see later in some of my projects how all those different design skills, right? Design disciplines converges into a solution for our clients. Um, just to start a little bit back is that what, what, you know, what's about us, about humans that are so different from the rest of, you know, the animal kingdom is that as human beings, we all have the ability to imagine something that material, right? Uh, you know, all of us here are creative. We all can create. And that is really fundamentally, you know, what sets us apart from the rest, you know, that might make us, you know, at the top of the animal kingdom. Um, and being able to create, bring to design, is in everyone, right? Uh, of course, it is about a matter of, uh, you know, learning and skills, right? And how you want to apply that, right, in various disciplines. And for me, my journey started <laughs> as a designer, right? Like most of you here, uh, this is me, was me, okay? Very young then, when I was, I think, just graduate poly. I, well, I graduated from NYP, industrial design. So this was my FYP graduation show and all that. See my hair, wow, that time it was cool, okay? So uh, I started off as an industrial designer because again, like, I like to create things. Uh, I, from young, I was always very passionate about creating things or dismantling things, right? Like Legos and all that and putting things together. Um, so I enrolled myself in, you know, in the industrial design course. I guess we don't use the word industrial design anymore, uh, but that was the time where, you know, we are really talking about, uh, you know, how can you use design to mass manufacture products, put things together. So there's the engineering com uh, com components as well and all that. Um, so, yeah, so so I was this like uh, fresh, you know, grad, kind of like, wow, I'm very excited about the world out there and I want to create, create, create. Um, so, of course, uh, I, after graduating, I had the opportunity to, you know, uh, you know, work uh, in design consultancies. I went to Milan as well. I took my master's. I had some working experience. So I think pretty good, pretty typical design path, right? Oh, you work, you know, design studios and all that. And I started, I was, you know, really creating a lot of things. Um, and then sometime, uh, a couple of years after that, uh, in fact, when I was still in Milan, uh, you know, still working, still working for someone, you know, uh, in, in the design studio. I was a bit itchy. La. So, so at the time I was like, hey, you know, we are designers. I really want to create stuff, you know. So I got together a few friends, uh, Yulia, Kairu, and Sharina. So Yulia is my wife actually now. Okay. <laughs> but that's another story. Okay. So then Kairu was our lecturer, actually. Yeah. So interesting to all the students here, you never know who you can collaborate with. Yeah. Yeah, so like Kairu was actually our lecturer, but you know, we all graduate, we all like working adults already. Lah. So then we say, hey, you know, uh, there's, there's Milan Fair, you know, I think we should do something, we should show our design, because you know, we are all doing our work, you know, working outside. Uh, uh, we want to show, design and show our own products to the world. And so we, you know, came together and said, okay, why not we join the Milan Design Week? That was like 2010. <laughs> yeah, that was quite a while ago. Um, but we got no money, right? Right. So we have no money. How how to make things together? Fly to Milan, set up show, and all that. At that time, the euros was really high. So we, I, I wrote in to Design Singapore Council. <laughs> at that time, you know, I said, hey, you know, uh, I spin a story la, that uh, I really want to show Singapore design on the world stage. Right. So I I wrote a proposal. Right. I really just write into that. I said I need some funding. 
right, to go to Milan and show what Singapore design is. And surprisingly, they funded us 50% of the entire exhibition cost, including air ticket, accommodation, exhibition, booth space and all that. Um, which is a pretty big thing for us. I mean, it's, uh, we have to put our own money, self-fund this 50%, uh, but to have the government, to have here some support, 50%, really encourage us to, to do this, right? Because it is beyond our, uh, you know, job, right? This is like in, at night, we were working together on night, brainstorming, having a lot. That time was, there, was, there was no Zoom, right? We were like emailing one another and all that. Uh, to get to get the collection together and so we did then we went to milan uh, we showcased at the salon satellite and milan design week then and wow uh, I, I i i would say that this was kind of like the start of of really where um, a lot of things changed for me uh, and my career trajectory so we showcased what we call the treasures of the literary dot right so we get this we have to write a story about so, uh, I mean, the proposal was about sharing Singapore design, right? So we call it Treasure of the Territory. And yeah, it was really well received. I mean, this was us on stage receiving an award from the organizer for, you know, having one of the best collection then and in that year. So some of the things that we shared is like this. Chapter 57, if there are any Singaporeans here, I'm not sure if you uh, heard of what is Chapter 57. 57. Chapter 57 is the law, it's a clause, right, in the constitution that, you know, there will be a ban of chewing gums in Singapore. So, so we were also playful. La. We, we wanted to, hey, you know, really take inspiration from what people don't or even foreigners don't really see or know about Singapore and turn it into desirable objects. And this is a lamp. This is actually a, a table lamp uh, that looks like a chewing gum, right? You know, we want to say, hey, since we can't chew chewing gums in Singapore, why not we can turn, you know, that chewing gum uh, silhouette, right? How chewing gum stretch and turn to a lamp, and it's really beautiful because uh, there was a lot of work into how to carve this uh, lamp. No, it is 3D printed, so we actually did the mold in wood and carved it and 3D and 3D scan and 3D pin it into this really really organic sculptural lamp. That because of the way you know the curvature and and, and the elasticity of how it looks, create that look the glow, right? The natural glow. Um, and of course, we also show other Singapore inspired products like Jia. Uh, which is, you know, Japan, right? It, so we want to make little table tablewares that have uh, allowed us to put spices in and all that. And also lambs like Diga, right? This is actually a lamb that is inspired by Singapore bird cages. So during our design process, we literally went, went around Singapore trying to find hidden gems or hidden treasures about things that we, even as Singaporeans, we don't we don't normally we'll take a second look, right? We walk past, you know, people that is hanging, you know, their birds, right? You know, in, in, in outside the HDB area, we just, oh, okay, that's normal. But when you have a project like this, where you are tasked in a way to find treasures of Singapore, you start to look at these things again, things that seem normal to you, mundane to you, that can become a really interesting inspiration. And that became the inspiration, the, the you know, the net that covers the bird cages became the inspiration for this lamb. This lamb was really well received. Uh, it is made of neoprene. There's no structure in it, but because of the way it is sold, it the shape holds itself, and then you can form and manipulate light, uh, which was very new at the time. That light is something that you can manipulate and interact with, right? Because you will normally look at light in the distance, and it's something that's passive. Um. So with all these uh, projects that we show, we we are really fortunate. We got into really a lot of a lot of publicity overseas, Singapore. Um, and that, that was, to be honest, a, a surprise to us. Uh, at the time, I was only 24. Yeah, I was 24. There was that, I got no business plan, right? We went to people asking, hey, you want to buy this? Can you make this for us? Can you, uh, what's the MOQ? All these things, we were like, uh, what are you talking about? We are just here to show, you know, of pro prototypes. So we had no idea about the business of design. We are just there to show. Um, but that made us also think about, hey, you know, what, what more besides making an expression, right? Design is a powerful tool to communicate. And at that time, we did successfully communicate the, or share what design is in Singapore to the rest of the world. Um, and that was really, to us, I think, a starting point in our next journey, right, as a design business. So because of that, 
uh, we started to uh, get more interest in uh, design work, freelancing and all that. And I think uh, two years after that, we decided that, hey, we if we want to do this seriously, uh, we need to, you know, really set our own company, right? To do what we love and to do projects, focus on the projects for our own clients. And so we did. Uh, and so that so we incorporated Tradivians, uh two years after that, um, at two zero one two, yeah, with a ten thousand dollar capital, right? So so that was a really uh, bold move, uh, and but we we were not businessmen, right? We were not businessmen. We just said okay lah, we just do full time, no? you know. So we just incorporate a company with ten thousand capital and just uh, put some tables and chairs, really ugly looking <laughs> office, uh, and, and just rent a very small space and just just start um, and, and we continue to to make things. We continue to want to share our voice as you know of design, share the voice of design to the rest of the world. So the other collection that we did at the time was called the Missing Dining Table. And this was a collection that was a bit different from the previous one in the sense that this is about imagining the future. So again, bear in mind that this is really, really many years ago. So our thesis, uh, that means the collection name is called the Missing Dining Table. So essentially we are trying to say that, how can we, what if the world, what if there isn't the dining table anymore in the world? What if we don't need a dining table anymore in our dining, dining room and so on, because of the way we eat, the way, you know, uh, we live and all that, that, you know, and I mean, even now, right, if you look at our, I think I talked to some students before, so I asked them, how, what, how do you use your dining table for? They say, oh, just to study law, you do work, right? So, so the whole idea of a dining table, you know, what it is intended for, uh, is not, is not used. So if there isn't a dining table, then what would change in terms of uh, the uh, tablewares, you know, as well as the tools, utensils that we used to eat? So that, that question, the missing dining table, forms the basis forms the challenge for this entire collection. And we, we did, and uh, this is called Botanica. Um, essentially, it's uh, like forks and spoons that looks like flowers that you put in a flower vase at home. It's like a decorative object. Um, but the idea is that, you know, these are decorative objects because we don't eat at home anymore, right? And at a very rare occasion that we need to eat at home, uh, we pluck off the leaves, right? So we pluck off the fork and spoons and then use them as disposables. And in terms of technology at that time, this is very doable. This is not saying something that is blue sky or can't be done. I mean, if you play with toys, right? Last time they also have those plastic uh, toys where you can, you can pluck off, you know, the components from the cars and, and all that. It's the same. Um, so that is what we, we showed. Uh, it was very well received. Of course, we proposed biodegradable plastic and all that. Um, then we also showed what if we have to, uh, you know, eat while we work, right? You know, we don't have a dining table anymore, but we still have our study desk, we know work desk, you know, and we need a lamp for us. Anyway, what if that lamp can be the same object that warms up our food while we work and eat? Um, so a lot of these objects are designed to challenge the notion of the missing dining table. Uh, and because of that, that propagation we gave ourselves, it made a lot of this design really interesting. Functional, I mean, it's, it's commercializable, but the typology has entirely changed. This is called Wago. Um, you know, what if you can eat on the go, right? It's like a trolley where you can tap out your food, you know, uh, and then bring it outdoors because you don't eat at home anymore, right? Doing a basic typo, and then you can just put it down flat like a picnic table and enjoy your meal. Um, so these are self-initiated projects that we did earlier on in our career, right? And that that desire, you know, to shape the future using design uh, was was very important for us as designers, as creativians, because that gave us that forms the voice for for us for creativians. Um, people start to see that hey, you know, design is not just about making something look good. Or you know, styling, uh, you know, uh, you know, a new product, or you know, uh, it's not just. It's more than that. It's about challenging the future, right? Uh, and I may just add before I move on to the next slide is that if you look across this 
uh, different designs. Correct. You realize they have some common design style, uh, and they actually, and you can see this copper looking thing, right? So they actually made copper plated. We we intentionally copper plate all the designs, you know, with the same uh, give the same consistent look. But there was also another reason why we copper plate, you know, all the designs. It's because copper is antibacterial, right? Copper is for thousands of years. People have been using this material because uh, you know it is more hygienic, and we thought it just makes it is total sense that we need to you know copper plate all these things because these are our antibacterial. And then of course now we know moving now future uh, COVID right, you know now we still copper plate masks and all that, which is interesting lah. But you know how the that future did eventually catch up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, uh, that gave us a lot of again awareness and publicity back overseas and back home. We are still broke. Uh. <laughs> so, so you see, you see uh, when we started a company with $10,000, we were just like doing design and really loving what we do, uh, showing work and work and work, making a voice for ourselves, which was really, really, really important. Uh, but at some point, you realize you cannot survive. You can feed your soul, but you can't feed your stomach, right? So at that time, the first year at Credibus, my salary was four hundred dollars a month, less than what I paid my intern, a guy that is you know in front of me. Yeah, um, because ten thousand dollars only, right? So it was very really hard uh, to just keep having voice, and because you have publicity, publicity can't feed you, right? You know, yeah, we were in so many publicity interviews and all that. Um, so that's when I also realized the importance of the business of design, right? That yes, we need to have a voice. We need to make a statement in the world, showcase Singapore, show what the future is. But we also need to come back and how can we, you know, and so for all designers as well, how can we turn this into something that's viable, right? Uh, so for so that the design industries and designers, we can thrive, okay? So that time I was also pretty desperate, lah. Really, yeah. Um, you know, cannot survive, lah. Just, just do work, design, design, design. So I started to try everything, uh, like getting myself really uncomfortable. Uh, I, I, I'm not a, uh, I, I'm, I'm an introvert, lah. Okay, <laughs> just want to put it out there. You know that I, you know, to have a typical nerdy designer doing things and all that. But to, then force myself because of you know wanting to keep the company, keeping the practice alive. Uh, and I need to do a lot of different things. So I started to go out, talk to people, knock on doors, try different things, do different type of work, uh, go to factories, th things that don't seem connected or relevant to what I'm doing. Uh, but I just, okay, I'll just try, I'll just do, you know, go to factories, follow my clients uh, to, you know, to look at components and all that materials, sourcing and all that, uh, which in fact was actually very important uh, in hindsight that uh, this, uh, as a my myself as a designer, the that I I managed to go out of my comfort zone instead of just doing design, design, design. This is my field. This is my bubble, right? I started to just let go and then try different things. See really what is real, what is really happening out there in the world. Kind of change also a little bit of uh, what I think about design and what I think design, how I think design can add value, you know, to 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 people as well to businesses. So as an SME, right, as because of the struggle as a designer, as a this small design studio then, um, I really have a soft spot for SMEs, for very small businesses. Because when you really go out there and look at all these things, really, you know, then you start to come back, right? Like, wow, we talk about the future, we talk about all this, but you come back, hey, <laughs> there are real folks out there, real honest businesses out there that need help, that design really can impact. And uh, one of the earlier and very interesting work that we did was with Pixing Chun. So Pixing Chun is the oldest tea merchant in Singapore, 90 over years So If you go to Chinatown, right, you will still see them there. It's still exactly the same. Um, um, but you will recognize their product immediately when I show you. Yeah. So they sell Chinese tea and they still handmade them, meaning that, you know, you have the aunties. Uh, so they are fourth generation business. So this aunties uh, is their relative. They've been working there for 40, 50 years. Yeah, their whole life, every day packing the tea leaves using hand. Okay. Uh, um, and this is, I asked why, I mean, like, 
why, why are you doing this in this such a traditional and, and non-innovative way? But they say because this is how they keep the tea fresh, right? And as well as this is just how what this what separates them, like what, what differentiates them from the rest. They are not really about commercial tea, but really about keeping the tradition of drinking tea alive. Uh, and can you look at all those on top of the shelf, those beautiful tin cans? That is how it looked like. The design has not changed for like decades. Yeah. Uh, this is the tea packages that you know they have. I'm pretty sure if you, a lot of you have seen this before. If you go eat pakute and all that, most of the pakute in Singapore are using their tea. Even in Kaifeng Crystal Jade, they OEM for them. Yeah. So this is just how it is, right? For the business for 90 years. So it's very hard for them to change. And and uh, in a bit of nostalgia part is they you know they want to keep the tradition alive. So when we were introduced to them and they were uh, they asked us to see how we can help them. We thought, wow, this is really interesting, but we also a bit taken aback. La. Like, wow, how to, you're, you're so behind me, <laughs> right? The, you know, the look and all that, there's a lot of work to be done. How, how can we keep your business relevant for today's world? Because one of the things that they share with us very truthfully is that um, people are getting less and less interested in drinking Chinese tea, right? You have your TWG, you have your, all that. Uh, cafes, but it's not about Chinese tea and it is really hurting them and to see a 90 over year old company fail is really heartbreaking. Yeah, so, so for the fourth gen, yeah, I mean, they, 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 they needed some ideas to keep this passion of Chinese tea alive. How, how then do we as designers <laughs> keep it alive? So one of the first thing we did was so on the branding part, First, we had to digitalize everything. It sounds like, well, what, what do you mean? Those artwork that you saw earlier, all the Tie Guan Ying and all that, those were drawn by artists in the 1930s, 40s, 60s. Whenever they launch a new tea, they will have the artist paint on it. They don't even have the original artwork. I don't even know how it looked like. Right? They are really like paint, okay? like artists going draw. So we've realized that first we need to make sure that all these elements of the brand, you know, can call them brand mascots, you can call them the brand assets and all that, and using more branding terms. We need to make sure they, they are preserved. So one of the first thing we do is we digitalize everything, all their IP. They didn't realize then that those were IP. Those were what from the grandmother to the grandchild associate with, you know, all the take on all that. So we digitalize them. So now, Pexin Chun don't just sell tea, they own IP. Right, because all these are associated with them, and then you can start to see actually, the Sinchun has more than just tea to offer. It has the whole world of drinking Chinese tea to offer through all the different brand elements. Uh, the other important thing that we did, besides branding and you know, uh, you know, changing the, you know the the look and identity of the brand, is really about drinking Chinese tea, right? So when we interviewed a lot of people, they mentioned. Ah, uh, drinking Chinese tea is so troublesome. I don't know how to drink. You have to pour, you have to wash, you have to do this, do that. Which is true. Uh, to be honest, before I work on that project, I also don't really drink Chinese tea. So uh, we decided, hey, how can we reinterpret the Chinese tea set, right? The, the pong, right, that they use to keep tea. And turn that into something that makes it easy for the users to drink Chinese tea from. And we did this. Uh, we use the same tea, tin container that they have. So it's, uh, it's it, in terms of product, it's super simple. I mean, it's a container, nothing innovative or like super complicated to make. But we put the entire placing chun world on it. And this becomes a portable tea set, right? Where you open it, when you buy, you open it, it has all the little tea, you know, pouches, and then there's a tea, tea pot, and then all that. And there is small little instruction menu. Then you can just use the lid of the tea, uh, the, the container. So essentially what we did in terms of design is we flip the lid, lah, okay? So instead of a flat lid on top, we give it a layer down so that, you know, you can place the tea and then you can wash. And so now the packaging has second life, right? The packaging is not just a packaging to put tea and sell, but the packaging is an experience. You, are, you can enjoy Chinese tea on the packaging itself, right? You can immerse yourself in the world of through the container, through the packaging. 
And if you see on the most right hand side image, there's this like little slot we put 50 cent. So this was interesting because when we design something uh, again, you know, having worked with them for having so many conversations with them, we realized that they are very, they are very strong values la, as a company. They believe very much in giving back to education for children. So we thought, hey, since anyway, we need a lid, a slit, sorry, a hole, right, to pour the, the tea away into the container. Why not we enlarge the slit so that it fits a 50 cent coin? So that even after you don't use this to drink Chinese tea, it can become a piggy bank. That's about it. We just enlarge this thing. So it is not complicated. In fact, this whole thing sells for $30, $40 only. It's really not complicated, not expensive to manufacture. It is about understanding the client's values, their needs, right? You know, how can you put all together into a design experience? And until today, this is still selling. Selling out, selling out, selling out. Before COVID, tourists will come here just to buy this. And we purposely made it very small size, so they buy a few, you know, put in their luggage, bring back. I'm not drink using this. <laughs> Sit around this in the container. So it was a, uh, it, it was a very good outcome, like, and one summer was because of that the sustainability of what yeah. uh, And then of course, uh, you know, in a in a small way, we help them to gain some traction back, right? In terms of the culture, keeping the culture, a tradition of drink, drinking Chinese tea back alive. Uh, and, and, and I think that that to us as designers was really meaningful because, you know, that is that state of that business through some design intent, design change, we keep something going. The other example uh, that I want to share is for Tidy. Tidy it's a waste disposal company. So you look at this, this is how waste is being sorted in Singapore, in Twasa, yeah. Um, so this client came to us and said, hey, we need to rebrand, uh, we need to, you know, change the image and all that. I said, yeah, you do waste disposal, need to do branding one, man. <laughs> like, but why? So they, but they said some things that really struck me and was very real is that first is, they, as, you know, operators and you know people working in the industry they always felt there's this stereotype uh, about them right like oh, waste disposal dirty nobody wants to join them somehow they don't really feel good about themselves and the same thing uh, like how i huh you need to do branding it's like we we always have this perception about this industry because this is an industry that is unseen we don't normally think about it uh we just throw our rubbish and then you know it gets sorted there are really real people there making things keeping our uh, you know, nation clean and all that. Um, and so we said, okay, let's see how we can help you. At that point, we were, we were, it also wasn't very clear what will the outcome be, what, what we need to do, what can we do to help them, right, as designers. I mean, it's not about what, making a new brochure, right? I mean, there's no packaging to design <laughs> and all that. So what, what right? Um, so this project is really more about uh, really using design thinking to see how we can redesign, of course, the impression of the brand, but also redesign how the business works, which I will share with you. Um, so before before that whole transformation project, you know, we we, we, we talked to those guys, lah. okay, you know, we interview, you know, everyone we interview from the bosses all the way down to the drivers, you know, the, the people that's doing, you know, operating the machines to clear the garbage and all that. And we realize is that, uh, and also as designers, it is important to really understand all the stakeholders, not just the client as in the boss, but down to the frontline staff, down to the actual people that's doing the hard work to understand, you know, what what's, what's, what the issues are, you know, what are the pain points, and what, what can we do to make the, it better. And we realized a couple of observations uh, is that, yeah, yeah, the perception of them it's, it's not, it's quite demoralizing, like, you know, like, you know, people always kind of give, look down to them and they, people don't, also don't want to go near them from the frontline staff, right? You know, when they clear the thing, clear the trash and all that. Um, and internally, there was a lot of uh, attrition, meaning people are leaving, right? Because, you know, it's not a very sexy industry and they had to hire. So internally, we realized we need to make this uh, we need to show that what they are doing is very important. So we came up with a tagline for them. It's called, we are happy when it's tidy. 
uh, tidy is the company name um, and this works both ways right uh, this is to of course for their staff for everyone there is that you know this is how this is how we are and, and in fact this is who they are they're very family oriented and they are all um, have this very warm feeling to them you know because you know they're so isolated so we want to make sure that you know wherever they they do you know the, the trash and then the whole uh, sorting of the, the trash and all that, you know, there's this sense of that pride that, you know, what they are doing is 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 for people's life to be happy um, and for them to feel happy doing that. And also for clients, for customers to feel that, hey, you know, when things are tidy and, you know, well cleared, you know, and all that, uh, they are happy also. So sometimes the design outcome is not necessarily a product or a poster. It can be a, a, a tagline, right? It can be a message. We design this message for them and this message become very important uh, in, in all the communications that we did later on. Another part that was that we kind of innovated was their bins, right? So maybe you have seen containers like that sometimes in, you know, factories or like you know, void decks, uh, car parks and like, you know, all that. So these are where they throw the trash. And before the, the rebrand, uh, all the, it looked very terrible. They are in terrible state, just gray. Uh, it's very sad. So it's like, hey, we want to brighten up the entire look of these containers, right? So we give you an orange uh, color ring. Uh, and in fact, if you go around Singapore right now, there are 200 of these containers around. If you see that one that is orange is definitely theirs. So firstly, it sets them apart from their competitors, right? Something so distinctive. Um, but it also elevated the kind of like the image of container of, of in a sense, trash bins, right? Right. So, so this is this works both way, right? This gives a better perception of this, you know, to the customers, to the public, but also themselves. And it's nothing more than a paint job. It's not difficult, right? So, you can see how now the tagline is applied to everything that they use, in the, the 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 uniform that they wear and all that. It kind of really directly convey the message of. What they're doing is very important and you know for them tidy we are here we are happily going to serve you and keep our country clean another key thing that was uh, innovated for them was really about the use of digital payment and this was very interesting because this was before COVID. Huh? Uh, at the time again because of the perception of you know the industry the customers don't want to touch them you need to make transaction not payment all that so they said hey no you know you guys need to Go online, right? Payment has to be either QR code using the iPad and all that. So we did the whole system for them, the design, we work with vendors and all that. And they are the first, you know, one of the first in their industry to do, yeah, totally digital payment. Don't you touch one, the customer, yeah, and everything just done. And it's also better because, uh, so first you don't have, you eliminated the need of the contact, hygiene, perception of hygiene, right? Uh, that the customers have, so that that worry wasn't there. And then, of course, when COVID happened, <laughs> so this was before COVID, can we help you? Everyone's going, doing this now. Yeah, so that was very interesting to observe la, that now even hawkers and all that is talking about digital payment, but they are one of the first. Yeah, and yeah, so this is a picture of them. Uh, it's a very, very, very interesting project. La. Yeah, to see how design, you know, through whether it's you know, in digital, tagline, brand identity, website, and all that, help really change, uplift, you know, the brand uh, of Tidy. Uh, this was actually something that was shared <laughs> in another talk that I had. Um, so actually, if you can see here, uh, there are tangible outcomes for Tidy, right? Of course, uh, you know, when they did a survey, there were more sense of pride amongst the worker. In, and in fact, uh, when we did this, when we asked them, about the transformation results during COVID, their sales increased. Yeah, their business got better during COVID. Yeah, because uh, you know they they hire more drivers, there are more bins out there, about twenty percent increase in business. So so that was really something that wow, you know that design can can do. So again, sometimes when as designers, uh, again you know we may be product designer, graphic designer, we may think oh then I need to do a product, or I may think I need to do a poster. Or, you know, a website. Uh, but it, it's not the case a lot of times, you know. Um, it's really about understanding clients' needs. And you realize sometimes that maybe it is a communication that they need. Maybe it's the sense of pride that they need. 
and then as designers, how can we design the right solution for that? Um, so of course, two years ago, COVID-19 happened, right? So that was really scary for us. Um, I remember this was a picture taken on the day that we uh, All right, um, we'll just wait for Kim Min to come back in, come back in. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yep. so, sorry about that. I'm not sure why there was a um, in Wi-Fi issue. Okay. Okay, uh, let me, let me uh, continue. Yeah, you were on the topic of uh, yeah, COVID-19. Yeah. All right. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> so, so I was mentioning about COVID-19. COVID-19 happened right um, years ago. Uh, and, and it was uh, it was quite hard now because suddenly Right. Firstly, of course, the logistic nightmare. You know, everyone has to go back to work, and what we're going to do. We also don't know how long it's going to last. Um, and of course, clients start to KIV a lot of projects because even clients don't know what's going to happen to them. Right. So um, it was. It was uh, at the time also. We were then thinking also like, hey, this is a crisis. Um, but yes, we can just sit down and hey, you know wait for it to pass, you know, can just don't do anything. Lah. I mean, Bopian, right? COVID. Or, or we can try to do something different or something more. So, so in fact, uh, when COVID happened, we started to even got even more out of our comfort zone, so, right? You know, as designers uh, to, to try to do new things because, you know, projects weren't coming in. It was you have this like, we have more free time to explore new things. Um, so my, my message was, is that, you know, sometimes, we just have to, the more people are afraid, the more you you think that this is an issue, the more I think you will find ways to, you know, find solutions, find ways to, to change that. Uh, and because you are desperate, right? You need to do new things, right? To see, you know, how you can get through COVID. Um, so we did a couple of things, of course, uh, during COVID-19. One is we launched a, uh, you know, like a survey, like, you know, we surveyed like a few hundred SMEs in Singapore and then we launched uh, a brand kind of like report, digital brand report uh, for SMEs. Um, so we did a lot of this kind of self publications work. Um, and we also went very aggressive in, in fact, in marketing ourselves, right, um, as a design business, as, uh, as designers. Um, and we did a lot of sharing during the COVID period. 
whether it's Zoom, uh, mostly Zoom, lah, okay? Um, and so for me, doing this type of sharing, again, wasn't natural, right? Uh, this was me 2019, just before COVID happened when I was in Shanghai. So, you know, again, if you see how, even my, my, for my own journey from, you know, doing design, product design, then doing other kind of design, I started to then do a bit more than just doing, but also to sharing about design. Uh, because, you know, we, we, we have to share, right? Because if not, we can't educate people about the importance of design, then we don't have work, right? And also at the time COVID, uh, it was also important to, to share that, hey, if you need your business to transform, if you, you know, design, you know, is or design thinking or branding, uh, these are useful, powerful tools, right? To help your business get on track. Um, so we 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 did a lot of a lot of that, you know, during COVID nineteen. Um, and then we started from sharing to mentoring. And in fact, last year, um, we worked with almost a hundred companies, you know, in furniture companies in Singapore, uh, through the Singapore Furniture Industries Council to mentor these SMEs on how to transform their business using design thinking. A hundred in a year, which is a lot, yeah. Uh, so we went on, we did uh, workshops, uh, in-person workshop, we did Zoom workshops, we did individual consultation with businesses, handhold them, you know, hundred companies, you handle hundred companies on how to use design thinking, right, the power of design to change that company. And it was a, it was very tough. I mean, it's very time consuming and uh, a lot of, well, a bit overwhelming, but it was so important because you realize that why these companies want to do this, right? Because they, they are also, you know, they, they need a way <laughs> to get through COVID. So they, they, they are also, you know, trying to find new ways to change their business. And uh, that's why they agreed, you know, they want to explore using design to do that. And for me, the realization is the work we're doing is very important, right? Uh, especially after working with these hundred companies is that the work we do is not just making something cool, fancy, uh, you know, uh, you know, this is life and death matter for these businesses. They can go anytime, right? They can fail. We are protecting these people's rice bowl, right? If we can use design to transform their business, they can keep their company afloat, they can pivot, right? You know, that, that save people's jobs, that save our economy and so on. Um, so, so to me, that is very important, lah. yeah, as a designer that, hey, you know, the work we do, you know, even though they are small SMEs, they, they really have a direct impact to these companies. This is a, yeah, some photos conducting a one-to-one -one session with the companies. And we also started to create tools to help them because we want to uh, make this uh, freely available, right, for SMEs to uh, adopt design thinking, help them think a little bit more about how, right, can they rethink their business model? How can they transform their business? So, so yeah, we just, we just did all this free and then just share with them. Um, and, and to us again, uh, when, like how we started, right. It's, it's, it's not just always about money. It's about feeling our soul. So this is, this is something that we feel very meaningful, uh, you know, to, to give it to the SMEs. I think another, uh, example, you know, as I'm finishing this up is that during COVID-19, you will see, uh, sustainability as a very hot topic as well. Yeah, so yes, we have companies that are, you know, not doing so well, but yes, also emerging trends and emerging um, important issues to talk about during COVID-19. And one of them is really about sustainability, right? And we talk about sustainability. Uh, yes, we, like the tidy example is, yeah, how do you, you know, um, disposal, recycling, all that. That's one part of sustain, sustainability. But we also talk about the sustainability of the country, right? Talk about food safety, right? Um, and I'm not sure if you, you recall in the news, you know, there was this panic about food, 
supply in Singapore, whether Malaysia and all that going to stop import because of it. And which is very real as a small country, right? You know, you know, we can get cut off from supplies anytime. So you can see now more vertical farms and then they are trying to bring back farms to Singapore. And this client, Blue Aqua, uh, is a local farmer that we uh, have worked with yeah, during COVID-19. And for them, uh, they are they are very gro they are growing business. They're ambitious, so they they wanted to you know to to do even more lah, You know, uh, in terms of uh, you know growing this this farming business in Singapore and beyond. And if you look at this, is a very typical farm. It's again nothing sexy. It's a farm, and then you know they also produce products lah, like mean grow and all that. That is our supplements and their uh, so pellets feed for fishes and prawns. So they are business revolve around farm farms and as well as selling products. Uh, but they were stuck. Lah. I mean, the farmers. So how can they get to the next level? How can they, you know, be now, right? Talking about food tech and all that. They want to bring their business to the next level. And so they, you know, we work with them on a rebranding exercise to see how to align the company's goal towards that. Um, so again, working with farm, uh, in the farm industry, it's not so simple. Uh, it's not. I mean, uh, we have to work with. We have to have calls and all that with different farmers around the world because they do sell products to different farmers. They do have other farms in other countries like India, uh, Cambodia, and so on. So we again, like how we did for Tidy, uh, we we have to do a lot of interviews, understand the farmers' pain points. You know what? What do they? How do they want to see the farm industry be elevated? So, so this is uh this is always a very important process for designers. We really have to always talk to stakeholders, um, because it is not just about what we want. I mean, it's never about what we want, right? You know that we put into our work, but it is about what they need, right? What works for them that is more important. So one of the thing that we did for them was to align their vision, right? Because there's there's only so many things. They got farms, they got products, they got in India, they got in Singapore, different countries. So what really is Blue Aqua about? So we created the brand essence for them, um, which is called Sustain Our Future. That from now on, the whole company, whatever you do, whether it's from farming to selling feed, supplements, you know, for the for the you know fish and all that, it's all about sustaining our future. And when we mean sustain. Uh, yes, sustainability, but also sustaining yourself, right? Sustain your hunger, so sustain our future. So this this little tagline uh, really helped guide the entire philosophy of the rebrand, um, as well as align all the different type of business units, uh, you know, together. And because of this direction, right? Again, like sustain our future, we needed to see how can we then express that, right? Um, so we. We work on what we call a blue aqua world, right? That means that in order for everyone, all the different stakeholders, farmers to investors and whatnot, to understand what really blue aqua is about, where blue aqua wants to go, we need to show it. We need to paint the future. Yeah. So we decided to literally draw out what is a blue aqua world, what kind of future they want to see, right? That the blue aqua wants to create. Um, so we illustrated um, this world essentially that serve as the key visual across the entire brand. And this was the packaging that they had before and became this. Yeah, so this is one application of using um, the key visual from something that is farm, you know, feed. it's not doesn't look so important and you know, like um, don't want to talk about design or that. But again, how can we make it something, you know, that is entirely elevated and you know, wow showing the farmers that sense of pride, right? That what they do and the future they want to see visually, even down to the packaging. Um, of course, across the website as well, you know, and the, all the different touch points that we did for them. Uh, how can we show this vision? The logo to the new one, right? And so on. Which is very interesting because uh, I think not a lot of people would expect a farmer, you know, to have this kind of visual, but then again, that is what we can do, right? Again, as designers, we want to our our skill is to really be able to paint that future for them, show them what's possible, um, 
and make that a reality, right? You know, we can imagine something and make it real, make, make it happen. And I'm just very happy to say, I mean, even just two weeks ago, they were in the news because of uh, after the rebrand, uh, they're going to build the one of the biggest farm uh, in Singapore, a $20 million farm, where they're going to increase our local fish production by 25%. Um, so to me, this is something that I'm proud of also as a designer that in a small way also we impacted the company's, uh, you know, the growth, right? Um, that uh, aligning their vision and they managed to, uh, to, to, to grow in this sense. And the growth is meaningful because this growth directly impact, again, the food sustainability of Singapore, right, on our national security. Um, and and it, is, it is very meaningful uh, to me. And in our little small way, uh, you know, uh, talking about sustainability is that, yeah, we also have this not-for-profit uh, setup that Credivians, uh, you know, operate. It's called Sustainable SG, and uh, where we are, you know, advocating sustainable living, sustainable products in Singapore, uh, where these are BWAX reps. So, you know, this uh, environmental friendly, eco-friendly reps that you use to wrap, you know, containers and all that. So we designed them. So these are actually all designs from our own designers. Everyone's designed by a different designer. Um, and then we sell them. Um, I think uh, it's important to practice what you preach. Lah. Yeah. So for us, uh, in a little way, again, we want to, uh, you know, show, you know, that design really, even if not, not just farm is such a, well, big way, but you know, even a small way on the consumer level that you know we can also make an impact to how people shop, right? You know, uh, consciously um, by by designing and producing and selling this, uh, you know, sustainable products, you know, to you know online and, and to people. Okay, uh, coming to the end of my talk, I think having shared some of the projects earlier, um, you know how design can transform, you know, businesses, how, how design has influenced even the way I think about design. Uh, I want to show a quick one minute video uh, because this video is a, is a company video for Creativians. Uh, it shows our five core values. And I think that as a designer, it is important to have this uh, in mind, right? Because what you design is, uh, is, you know, the values that you think about when you design something, will be translated, right? And to, to think, to have that, that values in mind when you design something, right? It's going to shape the world in certain ways. Uh, I'm just going to share you mine. And then of course, for you to have to think about yours. So for us at Credivance, these are our five core values. And whenever we design something, work on a project, we always adhere to these five values. Uh, if it doesn't, then we don't want to do it, right? Or maybe it's not a match to our philosophy. Um, so I, I think again, uh, as a maybe as a challenge, all right, to, to you guys out there, that are designers and you know, aspiring designers, is think about the value we want to bring to your work, and as well to the world. Um, so for me, I'm lucky that, you know, the work we do and all that, uh, a lot revolve around Creativians. Uh, when we started this, 
you know, as an entity in 2012, uh, we kind of call it like our Charlie's Chocolate Factory, right? It's a place where, you know, creative people, designers can come in and make things. Uh, and that's how I see Creativians is, as a place where, you know, good things can happen, where designs, you can come in and make things, and then the design, the output of it can change people's life, can change businesses, right, and all that. Uh, and that's my way of design, you know, of using design, right, to, to transform, you know, again, big, big lives, businesses, the world. Um, so, and what, what's yours, right? I think, uh, uh, not, not trying to say that this is, uh, this applies to everyone, but I think we all need to find our own way to create that impact, you know, as designers. We have that immense uh, opportunity. And, uh, it's going to be a messy journey. So, you know, I started as a <laughs> young body, fresh grad, this pro industrial designer. And I had no idea how my life is going to pan out. Uh, in a way, that's like design, right? You know, we're always exploring ideas, iterating, like design thinking, you know, changing change. So, in a way, design life is very similar. Um, don't don't be too cut, you know, hard up onto AI. Hey, I, I, you know, this is what I want, you know, I, this is the way, this is the only way, and if I don't get that, I fail. It's not, it's not like that. Um, a lot of good things can happen, you know, when you let, uh, you know, things take this course. Um, again, like design, right? It's, it's an exploratory, it's an iterative process, it's an adventure. So don't take life too hard. Uh, and of course, last but not least, you know, uh, some sort of reflection, uh, what is your superpower, right? Going back to the premise of this uh, entire talk is that design is transformative. Design impacts more than just that work itself, it impacts a lot more. Um, and what I shared is mine, right? How I use design to impact my clients, you know, businesses, you know, you know, the planet. And yours, what is yours? What is your way of using design, right? To transform, you know, the people, the life, you know, the world around you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Kim Ming. It's incredible. It speaks to us, us all on how designers can really make a difference in the world. Um, you certainly have increased my love for design. Having seen your works, um, how we can keep meaningful traditions alive in a beautiful way or elevate the livelihood for the people to apply design. So thank you so much for coming and um, this is this the the way people can track you or see oh track yeah. your work? Uh, so you, you can uh add me on the LinkedIn. QR code. Yes, yeah, you can uh happy to connect. Yeah, and again, uh I'm very happy again privileged to share a little bit of my journey here. So uh if you need more information, if more some questions, yeah. I'm here, I'm available. <laughs> yeah, I think the the uh students, do you have any questions to ask Kim Ming. He, he, although he has a wealth of experience, he really can relate to you guys as, you know, as young designers. Look at him, he still looks, I always tell him he looks like a fresh grad. <laughs> still young at heart with design. Do you have any questions for Kim Ming students? Don't be shy. You can put on your mic or you can type into the text. We'll give you some time to think about it. Okay, um, perhaps I can start with one. This is a question from Benny. Um, he asked, um, says that usually we associate an industry's transformation with the adoption of a new technology. But although new technologies are often major factors, they have never transformed an industry on their own. Um, to achieve such a transformation, right? What um, what exactly enables a business model today to deliver on such a transformational promise? Okay, uh, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, because you mentioned technology, you mentioned transformation. Right. Uh, to me, these are two different things. Yeah, technology is technology, right? If you talk about, the, I don't know how many years, the thousand years ago, the first technology is the wheel, right? 
the car wheel, right? Or, or maybe fire. So technology is just a new way of doing things. Uh, technology in different era uh, appears in different form. Uh. Now the technology is about digital, metaverse, and all that, right? So that's the technology we, we're talking about now. Um, and of course, in order to keep up with times, we have businesses have to embrace technology. Uh, but my observation is that transformation is uh, not always about technology, right? Firstly, it's about mindset. Um, and because technology is still cared out by people, right? So in order for a business to successfully transform, uh, actually a lot of times when we do consultation uh, with those SMEs, uh, it's not that they don't know the going digital is important. They know. It's, uh, I mean, they had heard about the government giving them grants and all that, but it's whether they themselves believe in it or not. So a lot of times we are there just to coach them, to tell them, hey, you know, this is important because, you know, doing this or embracing this technology will help you get to where you want to go. But sometimes it does not. Sometimes for certain industries, actually, you don't have to go to the metaverse. <laughs> so for example, yeah. So um, I think we just have to be clear, um, you know, when I talk to clients or, you know, as designers, uh, it's not always preaching the technology, but, but about what, what they really, really need. And sometimes you realize it's about a change of mindset or sometimes it's about, uh, you know, something entirely different, maybe it's a messaging and so on. Yeah, so let's keep our minds open. Yeah, I understand. The client's needs yeah. comes first in the objective met, yeah? Right, we do have a few good questions from the students. Um, first one by Brian, what keeps your design drive going? Wow, okay, good question, Brian. Um, I guess, I, I mean like a lot of you here, design students, right, I suppose. Yeah, the love of design. Um, yeah, I, I'm really just very passionate. I mean, people ask me like, wow, hey, your work very strong. I mean, I, I talk to fellow business owners because we are constantly thinking about new ideas, projects after projects. Every time it's a different thing. It's not like doing accounting, right? Uh, no offense to accountants, but you know, it's it's not one thing that we do. All the time. It, it's every project like farm, huh? waste disposal or tea. All these things we have to constantly learn, right? And, and then, you know, you change the way we think again and then but to me that is what drives me that, that could be you can say my personality my, my design i love to have this kind of challenge i love to you know learn new things meet new people right and that hey wow fun i can use design right to change them that excites me and that's what keeps me going as a designer yeah thank you in the heart of design. Justin asks, uh, asks a question, what do we do to prepare for the industry? Okay, uh, so good question again, um, your portfolio. I always look at portfolio, at least from my own experience when I'm recruiting, right? Um, yes, um, education is, is your first key, la, right? To open and the doors to the industry, which is very important, huh? okay? Is the first key, uh, but after that, right? Uh, really, a lot is down to your <clears throat> portfolio. So just a little bit about myself. Also, you saw me the picture, 18, 19 year old. Yeah. At the time, I was freelancing already. Okay, because I just like to do it, right? I I, do, I don't remember how much I charge. Uh. I mean, it was my clients must be laughing at me. <laughs> so, but I just do it because I want to do it, right? That actually beefed up my portfolio. I also joined a lot of design competitions. I lost many, I won a few. And the more I lost, the more I want to join and try. So uh, that, that actually got me into my master's, right? Ba on the basis of my portfolio. Because at that age, I already had such volume of work to show. Um, and again, I think that comes down to Brian's you know, like the drive, right? I think first the drive. Again, I think some of you are in maybe product or interior or fashion or graphic just 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 keep doing doing more do more than what the school asks you to do right yeah um and you will get a head start for sure and the industry knows right the industry people interview so many people they can tell the difference in it you know, from your portfolio well that leads to deron's uh, relevant question to Thoughts on going to uni versus building portfolio by working? 
because I think a lot of times parents also wonder, you know, should my should my design uh, police uh, kid go to uni and pursue? Yep. Yeah. Uh, good question. Good, yeah, good question. Good question. I, I don't know you, so I can't really tell you to do which one, but I would say reflect on uh, reflect on this. For, OK, now you are a designer, right? I'm assuming you are a designer studying diploma in design. Do you do you like what you do? do, do, do is this you are, are you very certain this is your career moving forward? Some people I interview, you know, some people tell me no, like, they don't know. Oh, OK, for you, yeah. OK, um, the thing is, Sometimes, right, uh, work experience is helpful for you to understand yourself better. Right, you work, you know what you like, what you don't like. Right, so that if you have that uh, uncertainty or, you know, just because I mean, at your age, I mean, it's just everyone's that this crossroad, right? You know, wow, am I going to build a career of this uh, design or maybe design related? Doesn't matter, right? So sometimes that work experience, that one year, to year, help you to really understand yourself better. And I do see examples of people changing. After that, they do something entirely different. Or when I interview, they are actually not from design and they they went to study design because in their work, they realized that's not, they don't want to do something else. They don't want to do accounting anymore. <laughs> they want to do design. So sometimes that helps. So don't, uh, yes, I understand how all parents think, even my own parent. <laughs> yeah, but um, if you really need that space, that time to think about things, uh, work experience is good. If you are very sure, go on to take your three, four years uni. If not, then you know you will feel that hey, I will regret later on. Yeah, so that's that's what I have to say about this. Okay. Well, Zi, you actually asked something that's relating to um, after you graduate, right? How do you get your first client, and how do you get the confidence to start taking on clients? Okay. Or yeah. maybe during as a student. Okay. So I think it. like so I say right, I look young. Uh, I'm not young anymore, la, but at the time I was really young when I started creative events. Can you imagine 24 year old, then 26, meet client, talk about tea. <laughs> right, like so so um I think firstly as a designer, uh, that 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 confidence is important. So I talk about myself first, right? I told you right, I was an introvert. I, I you know I don't I don't really talk like this in in the, in the past, right? Um, but I had to force myself to be professional. I had I had to I had to because if I want to get the project, right? If I want to get a client, I have to punch above my weights, and I have to create and show that kind of confidence and that kind of passion, that drive that I can make something different for our clients. And when you have that, when you when clients see that in you, they see your sparkling eyes, that confidence, that passion in you, believe me, they will give you the chance. And that's what happened to me. They could just say, you see how I give to a 26 year old, do my the entire brand, create new product. But good clients can see that in you and they will give you the, the chance, right, to try. Uh, and I must thank really my first clients uh, because they are like prototypes to me. Uh. I think I don't think I you know you know we uh, struggle and don't think we did a as great a job then as compared to now. But that's learning, right? That's experience. So you will meet great uh, Yeah. So just go out there and ask, show them your passion, your drive. Trust me, they will believe in you. I think Siwa Aida has got a question. Hi. Yeah, Ida um, has a question. Yeah, hi. Um, yes, Ida. Hi. hi. Hello, this hi. is Ida. Um, you mentioned earlier, right, about um, the need to address the business um, when you set up and you were earning something like $100 a month. <laughs> 400, 400. Oh, 400, okay, right. Um, at this point, maybe can you share now then um, how do you address the balance between the business and keeping it financially viable? Like, you know, how would you put a price point, you know, to the services that you have when you meet to your client, especially when someone, as you say, you know, as young as 24, 
um, coming with that business and with that creative solution. So how how do you pack your 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 services at price point? Because you know in design we always talk about okay we want to have this solution you know but sometimes clients say no you're just too expensive for me. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Uh, great question. Great question. Uh, because design our work is intangible, right? Like until now today, but I always tell people actually what we are creating is nothing physical. It, it's it's an idea. And then the day our deliverable is an IP, intellectual property. It's not something. It's not like a transaction. You, oh, you you sell me a mouse, I get a mouse, right? So a lot of clients cannot see that value. Uh, even today, right? There will be people like that. So when I was when we first started, of course we again we are not business trained. We're just naive. We just want to create, create, create. So I, uh, it, it was uh, we learned the hard way now, of course, that you know we. Um, we didn't know the value of ourselves. We didn't know the value of our work, um, and so we are. I think we are the charge quite, you know, quite significantly. But I think at that point of the studio, I think that is fine, right? I think it, 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 okay. You actually reach a balance. Let me put it that way, right? As you grow as a designer, as you gain more experience, gain more clients, you you as a designer, we also start to have the confidence in your ability and your value of your work. You will start charging more. I dare say what I charge now and what I charge before is at least 20 times more. Yes, because now I can say no to a client. OK, yeah, I, I, I choose my projects and I will only choose clients that value design. And there are um, the clients, plenty of clients that value design. They will pay for good design. For clients that don't value design, uh, I, I can already smell them mile away. You know, I wouldn't even bother. Uh, yeah, I mean, so to to, to all designers, uh, again, this is also important because you know we we it's very hard, right? To if someone again, how, how to how to do a good project takes both hands to clap. You and the client, the client will believe in them. You will not have a good project. Right? Yeah, and they will not pay a fair price to you. Yeah, so um, believe in yourself. Believe in what you're worth. The, again, like earlier question, the right client will come to you, the right client will pay for what you're worth. Yeah, so um, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Great, great, uh, great, um, great advice actually. Hold your fort, know your value, and they will come. Yeah. I think there is one more question here. How do you start on by Jia Cheng? How do you start on in the industry? How do you find a spot for yourself or company? Like, do we problem solve first or problem seek first? Um, this is a very good question, actually. That's a very interesting way to uh, raise that question. I think for me, if you look at our, some of our works, we actually do both, right? Like the missing dye table is a problem seeker. We are just here to make a statement. We want we, we make some observations and then we want to show the world what's possible. We, are, we want to create the future. Problem solving is a problem that existed, right? That you try to resolve now. Um, I think we need to do a bit of both. But if you mean if you're asking how we start started in the earlier, uh if you saw the magazine, right? That got four of us, you know, looking very cool. <laughs> there was a little message there. Yeah, there was a little message that they uh, like the bank they put out is that it, it said that we had to shout uh, uh, to get ourselves heard, something like that. Yeah, uh, and as designers, sometimes we need to do that. You know, we need to show what you know, what what more can there be. Um, so we we, we, we you you can you can you can uh, put up you know challenges to yourself. Show them that hey, there is a better world out there. There's a better, better uh, solution, you know, to maybe a problem that doesn't exist. And in fact, that is how new things are created, right? We, uh, we, we are always as designers, we are always trying to imagine a better world, right? Not just solving people's problem. Yes, we need to solve what's practical, what's important now, but bring them to the future, right? You know, and that needs you. To have that empathy, that observation, the skill, right? To find and seek the problem and then, then bring that together. 
Yeah, so I would say both. Uh, we have be much better questions coming in now. Uh, what were your, your encouraging words to the younger generation of designers that will soon enter the industry? Uh, okay. I think for designers. Encouraging words for like, the younger generation. Yes. <laughs> So if you see in my earlier slide, right, I think everyone has the ability to create, right? Human as, as humans, we all have the ability to imagine something and create it. Um, so I'm very, always very happy and, and you know, to share with young designers because you guys are the future, ma. you guys create the future. It's your world, you know. Yeah, it's it's your what you imagine that you shape the world in a certain way. So again, believe in yourself. Um, believe that, you know, believe that the skill as a designer, right, can change the world for the better. I, I think, for example, the topic of sustainability, right, which is huge right now. Um, as designers, sustainability is our highest calling. You know, because we are, you can say, a culprit for putting things out there. Right. We are not just a bystander that buys a product. Whatever, how our world is going to be shaped or how sustainable our world is going to be in the future will be shaped by what you do, right? what you design, the messaging you create or whatsoever. Um, and that is a very big responsibility. So my encouragement is, you know, a designer really is very important. Being a designer is a privilege. It's really a privilege to, you know, to directly shape how our world is. So uh, I, I really uh, encourage all the designers to think about, you know, your the, the future that you want to create and uh, yeah. And, 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 you know, the world you want to live in and that, that will really give a lot of meaning to, 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 to your career life as a designer. Wow, that was um Thing that hit me in the heart. Uh, when I was studying, I always used to think we, we create so much trash, you know. So it's a great way of seeing it, how we can instead shape and change for the better. Um, there is one more question here, probably the last question for today. Uh, how do you get so many publicity opportunities in your career? And did you actively seek them out or did they reach out to you directly? Okay. Um, I think earlier in our career, we uh, okay, so we did the we did take the first step, right? As for young, super young designer, naive designer, we went all the way to Milan and show our work. We are probably the only Singaporean there, and that gave us the publicity because wow, to the audience there, they see us as something different. So yes, I took the first step. We took the first step. If we had chosen just not to do it, there wouldn't be publicity, right? So that came naturally in a sense, you know, that came because of us taking that first step to go out. And of course, along the way, I think again, uh, for me, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really just so passionate about design. Uh, I, I always, I love to share, uh, you know, I, I, whether it's through clients' work or through our self-initiative projects and then all that. And I think that when you do something good, right, something worth mentioning, the media will pick it up. Yes, so just uh, you know, believe in yourself, you know, make sure that you know, whatever you design is, is of value, right? And I think that, uh, you know, if it's something that is great and all that, somehow, one way or another, you know, people want to share good design, people want to share good Very work, true. and they will share yeah. we, we need we, we need a lot of that now in today's world, Right, we are <laughs> sick of COVID-19 news all the time, which is true, you know. Yeah, the news wants and needs, people need the solution, people need... Uh, I think the Wi-Fi is, is quite bad, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, so uh, do just do good work. No, uh, Kiming is frozen again. Hello, can you hear me? Kimming, are you back? Yes. Yeah, you were frozen for a minute. Oh, okay. But, uh, we heard, yeah, we, we heard. 
passion drives initiative we take the first step yeah yeah I think I'll, I'll, I'll ask one very quick last question. Uh, I'm curious to know how big is your team in Creativian? Because you sound like you. Uh, it is the same as frozen. That's a must fun environment as well that you have. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I didn't catch that. Sorry. OK, maybe I'm frozen. Hold on. Uh. OK, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, I, I was curious to know how big is your team with Creativians? OK, uh, that's, in Singapore, there's currently 10 over of us here. We are made up okay. of uh, consultants, brand strategies, as well as designers. Yeah, um, so we do uh, our, we have, so, again, maybe I didn't really share, we always started creative events from Milan, right? So uh, we have a partner that is still there that's helping us with our clients work. But a lot of our work is currently uh, done from Singapore here. Currently, yeah. OK. Very uh, ex um, exciting to hear about your growth of uh, your work and your company as well. So Thuming, thank you so much for coming on today. I am struck on by what you've shared and taught us. It has been such an invaluable opportunity for design students as well. So I want to acknowledge you for your time, your commitment, your contribution, your offering to people who learn so much from the content you put out. We will make the world a better place through design. So uh, I will be uploading this recording on our Beyond Design Center YouTube channel and then share the link. So be sure to subscribe and um, until next time, my friends, be the difference, especially as a designer, because we can. So take care. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you very much. Well. Thank you. Thank you, Kim Ming. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good lunch, everyone. Thank you, Sumaya. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.